Live from WRAL News Headquarters in Raleigh, your number one source for local news. WRAL News, coverage you can count on. One minute a woman was standing on her porch, the next she was trapped in debris. Breaking news in Cary, where investigators are trying to figure out how this happened. And I'm tracking up front. It's going to bring us rain for Saturday and Sunday. It won't be a washout, but I'll show you the timeline so you can make your plans. Also, pro-Palestinian protesters returned to UNC Chapel Hill this morning. Their message to the university about the way their encampment was dismantled by police. We could see some scattered showers and storms move in this weekend. I'm Jeff Hogan. And I'm Renee Chu. We do need the rain, but there are also a lot of big events happening this weekend. Meteorologist Elizabeth Gardner is on the WRL weather patio with a look at why it won't be a washout. Elizabeth. So I've been tracking this front really all week long. We've been watching the potential for it to develop and then watching it as it moves across the country. It's produced a lot of severe storms and um, even some flooding down in Texas. But as it moves eastward toward the mountains of North Carolina, it is weakening. And once it crosses, crosses the mountains and moves into our area, it will be in a much weaker state. So this is not going to be a line of thunderstorms that comes through the area and moves on by. Instead, this front moves in, stalls and washes out or weakens. So that means we'll have scattered showers showers and pop up thunderstorms. So we'll start here on Saturday morning at 6 a.m. and we'll roll it through until lunchtime. And you can see we just have a small chance of, of a shower here and there, especially from the triangle area westward. It looks like that's where we'll have the best chance of a shower in the morning. There's lunchtime into the afternoon again and to five o'clock. The coverage is really light here and the same thing really during the evening. Then we'll stop it there at 8 a.m. on Sunday where it also looks dry. We move it ahead into the afternoon again by lunchtime and isolated shower pops up and then into the afternoon on Sunday a little bit more coverage so we have a slightly better chance on Sunday to see those afternoon and evening thunderstorms of course we are proud partners with uh, Cohen race for the cure it does look like it'll be on the drier side Saturday morning but there's a few isolated showers coming up I'll show you how much rain total we'll see Saturday and Sunday Elizabeth thanks we're following breaking news this noon. A Cary homeowner is recovering after her porch collapsed while she was standing on it. I want to stress that this woman is okay, but she went through some heart pounding moments for sure. WRL's Destiny Patterson is live in Cary at that scene. Destiny. <laughs> Jeff, Renee, just in the last couple of minutes, first responders have just left the scene, but I want you to take a look at this porch here. You can see it looks like a hole straight down in there. First responders tell us that this happened just after 9.15 this morning. Take a look at this video of what the scene looked like before. Cary police say that her legs were trapped in that debris there. You can see uh, what looks like pieces of wood there. Neighbors tell me they heard screaming before the very quick response from first responders. They tell me the woman was leaving the house with her daughter and then she got stuck at the waist. Luckily, her daughter did not get stuck. Firefighters say it took about 45 minutes to an hour to get her out. At this point, it's not clear what caused that porch to give out underneath her. There was a concrete slab that had her leg pinned between the slab and the uh, foundation of the house. And we had to extricate the occupant from that. So she was taken on a stretcher, but she is expected to be okay. First responders say that she was conscious and was able to tell them exactly what was happening and how she was doing while they were trying to remove her from that porch. Jeff. Quite an ordeal there, no doubt. Glad she is okay. Destiny Patterson live in Cary. Thank you. Pro-Palestinian protesters returned to UNC's campus today, trying to get their message heard for the university to divest from Israeli companies. WRL Sean Gallagher has been there all morning. And Sean, today's protest played out much differently than what happened earlier this week. Yeah, that's right, Renee. You know, it was a very quiet morning. These barricades that were put up, really not necessary as protesters gathered at a nearby plaza just off of campus. And what they were here for, it was largely peaceful, albeit a loud protest all the way through the campus. Now, it was an early morning. The group arrived here just after uh, 8 a.m. and had some speeches about the concerns they have about the Palestinian people and the issues with the UNC endowment investing in companies with Israeli connections. But then the group set off on foot around the campus, a nearly two-mile loop stopping traffic and peacefully interrupting students' daily activities. It is a contradiction of realities for some in the group, like this UNC, UNC student I spoke to protesting against the school he'll soon graduate from. 
I don't know. I think I'm proud to be a student here. I think the students are showing up, but I can't say that I'm proud. I'm definitely not proud of UNC and the system and what they're doing. And I know that absolutely no one is proud of the interim chancellor and the provost and how they've handled the situation and how UNC is continuing to choose to invest their endowment. And after about an hour and a half, the group met up at that plaza, uh, had some closing remarks, and then everybody left and were on their day. But as for these barricades that are out here on the quad, I reached out to UNC to see if they have any idea for when these will come down, but they didn't get back to me yet. In Chapel Hill, Sean Gallagher, Gallagher WRAL News. All right, John, thanks for that update. French police calmly cleared the main hall of one of Paris's universities this morning. Pro-Palestinian protesters shouted shame and free Palestine. A key demand of some protesters has been the breaking of ties with universities in Israel. Pockets of protests have been seen at some campuses across that country. In Australia, supporters of Palestine and Israel held opposing rallies. Pro-Palestinian supporters lined up their tents in rows at the University of Sydney today, chanting for Israel to end the war. They directly faced off with Israeli supporters. A memorial service is underway right now in Charlotte for Officer Joshua Iyer. He was one of the law enforcement officers killed Monday when a man opened fire from a Charlotte home as they were serving a warrant. People lined the streets as officers marched alongside Officer Iyer's horse-drawn casket. WRL's Matt Tallhelm is live in Raleigh where you've been listening in to the service. And Matt, this grief this morning is statewide. Yeah, it really is, Renee. It's not just the Charlotte community mourning the loss of these law enforcement officers. You can see it on the flagpoles here all across the state capitol area. This is outside the executive mansion here. Governor Roy Cooper ordered the flags at half staff to honor those four men killed in the line of duty Monday. The governor is actually in Charlotte for the funeral of Officer Josh Iyer. A horse-drawn casing led the flag-draped coffin to First Baptist Church this morning. It was followed by a procession of hundreds of Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department officers, staff and their families. Inside that church, Iyer's wife and young son sat in the front pew as the 31-year-old was remembered as a selfless, humble hero. Officer Josh Iyer, you are honorable. You are noble. Officer Iyer, you represent everything great about this badge I wear over my heart and this patch I wear on my sleeve. You may be physically gone from us, but your spirit carries on in our hearts. That's the police chief there. Uh, we also heard within the last 30 minutes, the final speaker was Officer Iyer's wife. She got very emotional through tears describing what he meant to her and her son. Uh, we will hear from her coming up at four o'clock. Iyer was a six year veteran of CMPD. He had also just been named Officer of the Month for his division last month. Now, the flags out here and all across the state will remain at half staff until sunset here. Officer Iyer will be laid to rest this afternoon in Charlotte. As for the man who was accused of sh that shootout and shooting at those officers, killing them, he was also killed in that shootout. Our thoughts go out to his wife and his son, three years old. Matt, thank you. A memorial service for Officer Alden Elliott will be held next week. His body was escorted yesterday from Charlotte to Catawba County, where his family lives. He was a Marine and served 14 years with the North Carolina Department of Adult Correction. He survived by his wife and 12-year-old son. Investigators are working to learn just how a fire started that caused major damage to a Fayetteville home. The fire broke out at a home on Trade Street about 1245 this morning. Responding firefighters were able to quickly put that fire out. There are no reports of any injuries. A major road near Lewisburg is back open this morning after a crash that left one person dead and another badly hurt. The two-car crash happened on US 401 near Herman Kemp Boulevard just before 9 last night. The road was closed until after 1 a.m. as crews worked to clear the scene. We're working to learn the names of the people involved. A road in Raleigh is back open this morning after it was closed because of a gas leak. that happened on Park Drive between Groveland Avenue and Oberlin Road. 
This is video from the WRL breaking news tracker. Dominion Energy responded to that leak, which was caused by a third party digging in the area. Next at noon, a New Jersey home explodes. Debris scattered all around a neighborhood. Now the search for a cause after a man was killed in that blast. Also dangerous weather still pounding Texas. The devastation and damage caused by a confirmed tornado touchdown. Plus, a new report shows fewer jobs were added last month than experts predicted. At 1230, we'll break down what that could mean for the economy. Keep watching WRAL News over the air channel 34 and Spectrum channel 1257. And happening right now in the WRL Live Center, we are following the latest in former President Donald Trump's hush money trial. Court is in session right now. This is a look outside the courtroom. Right now, Trump's former senior aide, Hope Hicks, is on the witness stand. She says she was involved in discussions uh, suppressing negative stories about Trump ahead of the 2016 election. But she also says she has no current uh, professional relationship with Trump. Earlier, we also heard from a forensics expert uh, delving into what he found on former Trump lawyer Michael Cohen. Cohen's phone confirming Cohen did Cohen had encrypted messaging app signal on his phone, but he also did not see any evidence of tampering or manipulation on data that was pulled from a recording on Cohen's phone. Again, Hope Hicks is on the stand right now. I will follow the latest and uh, follow this and bring you the latest from the live center. Officers in Portland, Oregon, are searching for the person who started this blaze, burned more than a dozen police vehicles. Officers and firefighters arrived at this training facility shortly before two yesterday morning. Firefighters were able to put out the fires. Nobody was hurt, but the, and the building wasn't damaged. The surveillance video showed a person cutting through the fence and entering that lot and then starting the fires. Investigators in New Jersey are searching for the cause of this house explosion that killed one person and injured another. It happened Thursday, shortly after 7 p.m. First responders arrived and they found two men, a retired police officer and his son, with serious injuries. The man died at the scene. His son was rushed to a nearby hospital. The home in this quiet cul-de-sac was blown to near shreds. Some homes nearby were damaged by flying debris. The governor of Hawaii is allocating $362 million in emergency funds to offset the impact of the Lahaina fire in Maui. Governor Josh Green says the money will help in several ways. It will compensate victims of the fire, temporarily lift some restrictions on use of funds, and it will give power to shut down illegal short-term rentals. The Lahaina fire last August killed 101 people and caused more than $6 billion worth in damage. A large tornado was captured on video as it touched down near Hawley, Texas. Many drivers on the highway pulled over as a twister moved across the area. The tornado was on the ground for some time. Six homes were heavily damaged in the area with at least two people suffering injuries. Tomorrow is the 2024 Kentucky Derby. One of the most frequently asked questions, what are you going to wear to the Derby? A hat, of course. Yeah. Shannon Cogan looks back at the fashion trends leading to the 150th run for the roses tomorrow. The fashion tradition uh, was uh, very much part of the Kentucky Derby from the very beginning because it was a place where uh, you were coming to see and be seen. Jessica Whitehead is the curator of collections at the Kentucky Derby Museum. She says the founder of the Kentucky Derby, Meriwether Lewis Clark Jr., did his homework before developing the upscale racetrack in Louisville. He and his new social life wife, went to England's Epsom Derby and Paris. There they saw just how beautiful the ensembles were that women and men were wearing to the races. And they really wanted to cultivate a similar atmosphere of um, uh, social elegance and of fashion elegance. His wife and her friends got that point across before the first derby in 1875. They dressed up to the nines. They all got into a beautiful open carriage and rode around the streets of Louisville, um, encouraged people to come out to the Kentucky Derby dressed in their finest. For those early derbies, fashion would have looked something like this. Hats for men and women were a part of everyday ensembles. In the 1940s, the designs became bigger and brighter, racing fans hoping to catch the eyes of the media. That journalists would immediately, you know, pick you out of a crowd and say, oh, I want to feature you in the Courier Journal. In the 1960s and 70s, people stopped wearing hats every day, but not at the Kentucky Derby. 
Here's Barbie at the 135th Run for the Roses. Cindy Lauper wore this to the Derby. She did. This is, uh, I think, a great example of an ensemble that combines haute couture with also sort of that um, uh, wild and outlandish uh, Derby style that you can really only get away with at the Kentucky Derby. In the 2000s and 2010s, the royal influence of the Fascinator was introduced, and it's becoming more popular. And the derbies during the COVID-19 pandemic is a time to be remembered. We were seeing milliners actually designing hats to go with specifically designed beautiful masks and uh, selling these sets of accessories. Now, what will we see for Derby 150? Anything goes. <laughs> The higher, the wider, the hat, the better, huh? That was Shannon Kogan reporting. Ticket prices for the big race hit record prices. The average ticket now going for more than $1,200, according to the online ticket website Ticket Smarter. And that's up sharply from three years ago when tickets averaged $735. The Derby is a bucket list event for a lot of folks and not just horse racing fans. Yeah, the annual Run for the Roses airs tomorrow right here on WRL. We will have coverage of the Kentucky Derby 2.30 to 7.30. I always reserve my light mm -hmm. blue seersucker suit for that day oh. with the bow tie. Okay, and I have some fascinators in the closet, too. <laughs> you <laughs> Elizabeth, never miss it. Elizabeth Garner yeah. should be wearing a fascinator out there on the patio. Right. It's perfect for outdoor. Perfect vibes there with the gardens in back, Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah, and I've got kind of this, like, fluffy dress. That, you know, a hat, would, you know, a big fluffy hat would, uh, would work with. I'll have to. If I get invited to any derby parties, I'm, I'm all ready to go. But it is tomorrow, right? I guess I, I, guess I didn't get invited to any. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the, at the gardens. I'd rather run around in the woods, though, any day. Let's take a look at what's happening out there. It's beautiful. It is warm. We hit 92 yesterday, tied the previous record. That was the first 90-degree day of the year officially at RDU, and we're on our way to that same temperature this afternoon. But it looks beautiful. Lots of sunshine. We are seeing some high, thin cloud cover. That should keep our temperatures down maybe a couple of degrees compared to yesterday. Right now, it's 83 degrees. Our wind is southwest at 8, so there's a nice little breeze out here, um, but we'll climb on up to 90 degrees by around four or five o'clock this afternoon. And you know, it's all about the humidity. It can hit 90 degrees. And if our dew points are nice and low, it's not so bad, but we've seen more moisture roll. And that's one of the reasons that we're seeing some cloud cover. That cold front that I showed you at the beginning of the newscast as it gets closer to us, feeding in some cloud cover and some moisture. We're not gonna see any rain with any of these clouds, uh, but it's just a sign that all of that is kind of getting cranked up out there. It is 79 in Roxborough right now, 82 in Fayetteville, 79 in Clinton, 85 in Rocky Mountain Wilson. So it's warm. Temperatures are a little cooler than this time yesterday, about three degrees cooler in uh, Fayetteville uh, as well as Raleigh and Durham. So again, we should keep it right about 90 instead of the 92 that we saw yesterday. We will see some increase in our cloud cover later on today, but there's no rain in the forecast until tomorrow. Oh, uh, when I saw that pop up in my graphic just a little while ago, I was like, man, we've made it to 66. That puts us in the steamy category. We really haven't seen any of that so far this spring. But with our temperatures warming up, the warmer the air is, the more moisture it can hold. And of course, that dew point is the number that corresponds with how moist it is outside. So uh, once we climb into the mid to upper 60s, it feels steamy, it feels tropical. And that is where we are headed as we get into the weekend and early next week. So I hope you enjoyed spring. Um, um, we may have seen the end of it. 77, though, is our normal high. It's just well above normal at 90 today. Then we're in the low 80s Saturday, Sunday, and Monday because of that chance of some rain. And once we get past uh, Monday into Wednesday, we have the potential for some high heat. We have the heat risk map at medium. We're going to climb into the mid-90s, but at least we'll have some cooler temperatures with this front coming through. We'll walk through it again. Um, Saturday morning, we're fairly dry. We get closer to lunchtime, and we begin to see just a few isolated showers pop up in the afternoon from Raleigh westward. We may see a few isolated thunderstorms, but it's really not looking uh, terrible. We do have a little better chance of seeing some thunderstorms in the afternoon on Sunday. We'll walk through that again coming up in just a little while. We need the rain and we continue to have chances Monday and Tuesday as well. We'll talk about how much we could see over the next few days coming up. All right, Elizabeth, thank you. Well, something was growing inside a Cracker Barrel's walk-in cooler. Mm. What an inspector suggested the restaurant do coming up in restaurant ratings at four. And also today at four, Nancy Pelosi claims Donald Trump has the worst record of job losses out of any president. But is that true? We will take a look at the factors and explain why she's only sort of right.
And still ahead this noon, if you rely on alarms on your iPhone to wake you up in the morning, you might want to have a backup. The alarming issue the company is finally addressing after days of complaints. From the venue to the flowers to the photographers, the average cost for a wedding, more than $30,000. Coming up, how AI is helping couples save a lot of money on their big day. Taking a live look in Fenton in Cary right now and beautiful blue skies breaking through some of those clouds. The heat is on. Certainly we are already in the 80s this noon hour. Federal Trade Commission has given the go ahead for a major merger between ExxonMobil and Pioneer Natural Resources. A $64 billion deal can move forward only if Pioneer's former CEO does not serve on Exxon's board of directors. Pioneer announced his retirement from the company in the spring of last year, but he is still on Pioneer's board. The FTC alleges that former CEO exchanged information with OPEC officers about limiting oil supplies in order to control oil prices iPhone users are sounding off about the alarm clock. Many users are sounding off on social media saying they have overslept because they are not hearing the alarm. Apple says it's working to fix the issue, but it's not sure how many people are affected. In the meantime, the company says that turning off the attention aware feature has helped with the alarm clock issue. The feature allows an iPhone to check whether someone is looking at their device, and if they are, the phone will lower the sound of alerts. Audible is testing book recommendations based on your viewing habits on Prime Video. Audible is owned by Amazon. You could see recommendations as straightforward as the book um, or a movie you watched is based on or uh, authors that users with similar preferences have enjoyed. Audible says there's a natural synergy between TV, movies and books, and it's seen that in how its customers engage with content. Artificial intelligence can help you write an essay, translate a foreign language, even give advice. So why not let it help you plan your wedding? Couples across the country are turning to AI to help them celebrate their big day. From the program, bouquets, decorations, even finding a location. One woman says AI helped her save between five and $10,000 on her wedding in upstate New York. Traditional wedding planners, though, say there's no replacement for the human touch. It's the manpower, setting up the tables, making sure the table numbers are right, making sure the chair counts are right. And honestly, we're peace of mind a lot of times where we know the person so well by the time they get to their wedding that if I see them nervous about anything, I can fix it. Although wedding planners say AI should not replace their work, some have found ways to incorporate AI into their businesses to streamline the process. The U.S. economy added fewer jobs in April, but the news isn't all bad. We'll tell you how the stock market reacted to the news. Plus, Hamas is considering a new framework for a ceasefire deal. And here's a look at your winning North Carolina education lottery numbers. We'll be right back. Shot in 4K ultra high definition, your number one source for local news. WRAL News, coverage you can count on. The U.S. added fewer jobs than experts were expecting for in April. That's according to the new jobs report released this morning. WRL's Noah Klein is here now to break down those numbers and what it means for the economy as a whole. Noah. Renee, let's start with the job growth here. You mentioned it slowed down. I want you to take a look at the numbers here. We're talking about 175,000 jobs added for April. And that's not just below estimates, but also well under the 315,000 in March. You take a look at that difference and you see what we're talking about. The bigger picture here, unemployment rate went up to 3.9%. That's against some of those expectations that it would hold steady at 3.8%. Meanwhile, when you include people not looking for a job and people with those part-time jobs for economic reasons, that rate also edged up to 7.4%. That's the highest level it's been since November of 2021. The labor force participation rate, that's people actively looking for work, was the same at 62.7%. An economist with UNC's Keenan Institute talked about what that number could mean moving forward. The attractiveness of working, I suppose, going forward may not be as high as it was for the past couple of years for anybody, including for older individuals, unfortunately. 
Following the decision, the Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell characterized that jobs market as strong, but noted inflation is still too high right now. Stocks, we should mention, did jump early this morning with this report boosting some hopes that the Fed could cut interest rates soon. Renette? And that slowing job market is something that the Fed is excited about. Yeah. Noah, thanks. Israel and Hamas militants appear to be seriously negotiating a ceasefire deal in Gaza and the return of Israeli hostages. NBC's Raf Sanchez reports from Tel Aviv. For days now, Israel, the U.S. and the world have been waiting for Hamas to respond to the current ceasefire proposal. But Hamas not yet giving a definitive answer, instead saying it will send negotiators back to Cairo as soon as possible to continue discussions and try to finalize an agreement. Now, that is positive on the one side, but also an indication that Hamas is not yet ready to give an answer either way. Israel says time here is not unlimited and that despite American opposition, it is preparing to move ahead with an assault on the city of Rafah. Now, more than a million Palestinian civilians are sheltering there. The White House says any attack would be a disaster. But Israel says it has no choice. It needs to go into that city and destroy the remaining Hamas battalions who are hiding there. There is at this point more aid getting into Gaza than before. That's partly because Israel has opened up a new crossing under intense American pressure. The White House also says that it is just days away from the completion of an American military temporary pier off the coast of Gaza, which is designed to bring more food in by sea. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin overnight saying at this point, the U.S. does not have any intelligence that indicates that Hamas would attack American forces manning that pier. But he pointed out that this is a battle zone and it is an unpredictable situation. Raf Sanchez, NBC News, Tel Aviv. This morning, police cleared out protesters on campus at Portland State University. Pro-Palestinian protesters occupied the library there on Monday. The school says the library will now be closed for several months because the damage that was caused there. That includes broken computers and furniture. The fire alarm system was also destroyed. And happening right now in the WRA Live Center, evacuation orders are widening after heavy rains led to massive amounts of flooding in the Houston area. Emergency crews were outperforming high water rescues after that heavy rain. Officials are warning residents to prepare for the worst. The area has seen very heavy amounts of rainfall in a short amount of time. More than nine inches of rain fell in the past 24 hours. A flash flood warning was also in effect there this morning. Storms are expected to continue through this weekend. A bill that will force sheriffs in North Carolina to cooperate with immigration officials is closer to becoming law. The bill is moving to the House for a final vote after the state Senate approved it yesterday. It requires sheriffs to check the immigration status of anyone charged with a violent crime and honor voluntary ICE detainers for 48 hours. It also gives the state attorney general the power to enforce the law. North Carolina dropped two spots in annual teacher salary rankings. That's according to a report by the National Education Association. The group says North Carolina's average teacher salary is almost $13,000 below the national average. The group says North Carolina now ranks 38th in the country when it comes to teacher pay. The Durham Fire Department is hiring and it has opened applications for entry level positions through May 19th. You don't need any experience. The training at the academy is paid for. Chief Bob Zoldas says it is a great way to serve the community and the pay is likely to improve. The city council is right now considering a, a really nice pay raise for our members. And uh, if it passes, and a recruit graduates from recruit school, they'll be making 51,559 uh, as of uh, May of next year when, when this school graduates. And the department also expects to hire certified and lateral firefighters in midsummer as well. North Carolina First Lady Kristen Cooper has received a special award. She was honored last night with the Hope Center's Bridge of Hope Award for her longtime commitment to helping foster youth. Elizabeth Gardner emceed that event. The Hope Center helps foster children navigate the transition to adulthood. It serves foster teens ages 13 to 18 and young adults ages 18 to 24 who have aged out of the foster care system. Well, you know, it's a battle. There's no easy way to lose weight. Why the huge popularity in weight loss drugs is complicating expectations and results. 
Pets are instant mood lifters. The science behind their positive impact on our mental health. Now, if you see news happening or you'd like to share a story idea with us, click report it in the WRL News app. We now know the first game of the second round series between the Carolina Hurricanes and the New York Rangers will be played on Sunday. The Canes got the word from the league and made the announcement on social media late last night. The time of the game has not yet been announced, but games one and two of this series will be on the road for the Hurricanes at New York's Madison Square Garden. Tomorrow, people here in the Triangle will unite in the fight against breast cancer. The Triangle Race for the Cure is tomorrow at Research Triangle Park. Lena Tillett and meteorologist Mike Mays will be there. WRL is a proud sponsor. There's still time to join or you can donate to Team WRL. Visit WRL.com and search Komen to learn more. Today, President Biden is presenting the Medal of Freedom to 19 people. Former North Carolina U.S. Senator Elizabeth Dole is one of the honorees. Dole represented North Carolina in the Senate from 2003 to 2009. Other honorees include Al Gore, Nancy Pelosi, a World War II soldier and the late civil rights leader Medgar Evers, as well as Academy Award winning actress Michelle Yeoh. The Medal of Freedom is the nation's highest civilian honor. A talented group of musicians is once again headed to New York City for the Essentially Ellington Festival, but you can see them in person before they head out. That's just a taste of the Triangle Youth Jazz Ensemble. I love chatting with them, and they played live during our new newscast on Wednesday on the WRL patio. Such a memorable performance. You can catch them playing this Sunday at 4 p.m. at Jones Auditorium at Meredith College in a concert. Tickets are still available through their website. They've got a smooth sound. Mm -hmm. Really good. Well, you may have heard there is a little thing going on. Mm. Race in Kentucky tomorrow. He's a great ambassador for what is great about this sport and what keeps it going. How about this? After the break, we'll take you to a farm in Kentucky where raising thoroughbreds is a source of cultural pride. Also, lounging, yelling, making a ruckus. Visitors at San Francisco's Pier 39 just can't get enough of this show. Find out what attracted a record number of sea lions this year. Just maybe there's a cool ocean breeze that is keeping things a little more comfortable down at Carolina Beach. This live look right now as you watch WRAL News available on Spectrum and the WRAL app on your TV or streaming device. Ideal temperatures for the beach. With interest in injectable weight loss drugs growing nationwide, doctors are unraveling some misconceptions. Chanley Painter reports it will take more than the shots to help people win the battle over unwanted weight. More and more people are taking a jab at using injectable medicines to combat obesity. The company behind the popular weight loss drug Wegovi revealing at least 25,000 people in the U.S. are starting to take the medicine every week. Wegovi is just one of the options for people looking to shed pounds. These types of drugs imitate brain and gut hormones in the body to regulate people's appetite and help them feel full. But physicians say the shots alone won't solve everyone's problems with food. The drugs are really designed to be used as part of a very, very, very comprehensive and personalized treatment plan that also includes dietary strategy, physical activity, and behavioral modification. Dr. Katherine Saunders says obesity is a chronic disease that needs to be treated long term, but a study in the journal Obesity reports less than half of patients who filled a Wegovy prescription in 2021 or in 2022 were still taking the drug a year later. When people stop an anti-obesity medication, we expect that their weight goes back up. Some patients on weight loss drugs report side effects including nausea and constipation, but other factors are influencing people to stop the shots. I would say two of the biggest reasons right now um, are cost and two is supply. Going cold turkey or taking these medications a little bit at a time can cause some patients to start having intrusive thoughts about food and other obesity symptoms. 
That was Chanley Painter reporting. Data from health tech company IQVIA finds more than 3 million prescriptions for new weight loss medications are given out every month in the U.S. May is Mental Health Awareness Month, an excellent time to find the things that improve our moods. One of the top mental health boosters is closer than you might think. Our pets, they're proven to bring positive mental health impacts to our lives. They're valued members of our families and provide great comfort. Animals also help us socialize and stay active, both great things for improving mental health. A veterinarian, Daniel Bernal, explains our body's chemical reactions to spending time with our pets. Pets will lower your blood pressure and decrease cortisol, which is a stress hormone. Now that's really key to mitigating those long-term chronic stress issues. Responsibilities that come with having pets can be just as beneficial as the perks. Dog owners walk an average of 22 more minutes a day than non-pet owners. It seems pets can have that positive effect on us all. I can vouch for that. They're always in a good mood. They're good listeners. <laughs> Another good mood booster, the weather yeah. when there's sunshine outside and when it's not too hot. Meteorologist Elizabeth Gardner out on the WRL weather patio and uh, it feels nice out there, doesn't it, right now? It's fine. I mean, I will say it's a little on the warm side and it's a little on the humid side. I mean, that's terrible. It doesn't feel like July by any means, but you know, we've had some really pretty weather so far this spring and kind of edging towards summer in terms of the way it feels out here. We'll take a live look at the gardens right now. There have been people um, in and out enjoying our beautiful gardens uh, this morning and into the afternoon. It's not bad to be out here. Again, it just feels a, a touch more muggy and uh, it's uh, just a little bit warmer. Now, we're going to be cooler with this cold front coming through. Of course, this front has moved across the country, and it's brought a lot of severe storms. It's brought some flooding to parts of Texas. But as it moves across the mountains, it'll be weakening. As a matter of fact, you can see what happens as it moves eastward. Um, some of the, the warm front, the cold front kind of fizzles out a little bit. Um, we'll see that trough of low pressure continuing to move across the mountains. And, of course, it moves through here and continues to weaken. And so we don't have a distinct line that will come through in terms of a front. That can be pretty easy to time out. You know about when it's going to arrive and about when it's going to leave. That's not really going to be our pattern. This front will weaken. We'll have enough energy in the atmosphere for a few isolated showers and thunderstorms, um, but they'll sort of pop up, you know, here and there. We take a live look at, or a look here at uh, Futurecast starting Saturday at 6 a.m. A few isolated showers for us in the morning up until lunchtime, and then we have some waves that will roll through late afternoon and evening, but the coverage that we see Saturday is fairly light. It's a little heavier the farther west you go. Then Sunday, we'll kick things off here at uh, 8 a.m. and pause it at noon. Again, a few isolated showers pop up a little closer to lunchtime. And this version of Futurecast has a bit more showing up in the afternoon on Sunday, so it may be a little wetter Sunday afternoon than Saturday afternoon. Um, in general, though, we're looking at about a 50% chance for both days, a 60% chance on Monday, and then we're going to hold in place Tuesday and Wednesday, too, just a slight chance of a shower or thunderstorm. Um, still not looking at a ton of rain. I mean, you were looking at the cover there that we were going to see. So it shouldn't be too surprising. We'll likely see somewhere in between a quarter of an inch and a half an inch for Saturday and Sunday combined. Sunday looks a little heavier than Saturday. Saturday morning, we it will be cloudy. There might be an isolated shower. We're going with 20%. We have a bunch of college commencements on Saturday morning at 9 a.m. NC State, uh, Central, and St. Aug all at uh, 9 a.m. And the weather looks like it's going to be Okay, it'll be cloudy, a small chance of a shower. Ham and Yam, I didn't mean to go through that so quickly. Ham and Yam, we're proud partners uh, for Ham and Yam. Temperatures will climb into the low 80s, but Saturday afternoon, the farther we get into the day, the better chance we'll have a few scattered storms. If you're headed to a derby party Saturday again in the afternoon and evening, you know, about race time is when we'll have a better chance for some isolated thunderstorms. Um, in Kentucky, it's a 20% chance. does not look like the race will be a rain out. So uh, we have Race for the Cure on Saturday morning as well. Right now, just again, a small chance of a shower first thing in the morning and then a better chance later in the afternoon. I don't want to even look at Wednesday. Did you see that? 94? What, what happened to spring? Yeah, I, I didn't look. Gone. Um, I can't look. <laughs> right. Don't look at Focused it. on the cool down for the weekend. All right. 20 degrees higher than our normal. Right. Thanks, Elizabeth. And it's funny to watch them fight and uh, yeah, and relax in the sun. Exactly. After the break, the reason behind this record swarm of seals at San Francisco's famous Pier 39. We wrap things up with a look at a few of the headlines we are following for you today. 
Breaking news, a Carrie homeowner is recovering after her porch collapsed while she was standing on it. This happened on Joel Court off High House Road near downtown Cary. According to firefighters, it took more than 45 minutes to get the woman out. We're working to what caused her porch to collapse. Pro-Palestinian protesters return to UNC's campus today. They're trying to have their message heard for the university to divest from Israeli companies. The group had several speeches about their concerns as they walked around campus. After about 90 minutes, the group met back at the Peace and Justice Plaza and ended the event. The U.S. added fewer jobs than experts were expecting in April. That's according to the new jobs report just released this morning. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell characterized the jobs market as strong, but noted that inflation is too high. Stocks did jump early this morning with the report boosting some hopes that the Fed could cut interest rates soon. Tomorrow is the 150th running of the Kentucky Derby, and we are taking a look at a horse that once topped them all. Silver Charm won the Derby in 1997, and a photo finish it was by a nose against Captain Bodgett. Well, now at almost 30 years old, he entertains visitors at a horse farm in Kentucky where they relive memories of his Derby win and enjoy his friendly gentleness. The reason that a lot of fans come here to visit these horses and donate money to buy to uh, so to, uh, donate money to support the farm so we can pay our bills. Um, they come here because he's the star. Well, this is a little heartbreaking. The stallion only has four teeth left, but the keeper says that is enough to eat 200 pounds of cookie crumbs per month. Don't miss the most exciting two minutes in sports tomorrow right here on WRAL. We'll have coverage of the Kentucky Derby from 2.30 to 7.30. San Francisco's Pier 39 is overrun with revelers. We're not talking about humans, but people. This week, Pier 39 has seen more than 1,000 sea lions, the most in 15 years. It's a great tourist attraction, but some local officials are concerned about the weight the sea lions are putting on their lounging barges. Still, people are taking it all in. We came here a few minutes ago and it's awesome to see them. It's very loud, of course, but it's, it's really nice to see all of them. And it's funny to watch them fight and, uh, yeah, and relax in the sun. It's not like in a zoo. You're not, they're not trapped. They can be here if they want to be here, but it's just so cool to see them all here. And it's so interesting. They're so loud. Yeah, overrun by all those sea lions. Pier 39 Harbor Master says the swarm comes down to one thing, food. A huge school of anchovies. Once the sea lions fill up on food, they'll make the journey to the Channel Island for mating season. All right, we just love the name of our pet of the day. If his picture looks like he's up to a bunch of malarkey, that's because that's his name. Malarkey is a four-year-old <laughs> neutered male cat. Friendly and affectionate, doesn't mind being left to his own devices sometimes. Malarkey's hit or miss with other cats, so be on the safe side. He'd probably do best in a home where he gets to be the only cat. For more information about all this malarkey, you can visit spcawake.org. 20 million people nationwide are in recovery for addiction. Up next, we meet some of the people from our area reclaiming their lives free of drugs. So it's big weekend, 150th run for the roses. Mm -hmm. Gonna watch the Derby, got to. I am, you. And also, <laughs> well, I, I will try, yes. And then also the Ham and Yam Festival in Smithfield and the Triangle Race for the Cure for Komen. Lots happening in the, uh, around the Triangle this weekend. Big, big weekend. NBC News Daily is up next on WRAL, your next local news update in 30 minutes. You can get breaking news updates anytime with our WRAL News app. Have a great day. Keep watching WRAL News over the air channel 34 and Spectrum channel 1257.